Hello and welcome, everyone, to episode 68. Today, I'll be continuing my series on animal physiology by looking at a very important and very fundamental aspect of animal life. All organisms, be they plants, bacteria, fungi, animals, you name it, all organisms need water. Water is the stuff of life. It is the universal solvent, the polar solution that provides the fertile setting for the biochemistry of life. All organisms need water to stay hydrated. Water is the base substance that fills the cytoplasm of the cell, that composes the blood and the lymph and all the internal bodily fluids of animals. Fungi cannot engage in saprophytic digestion without water. Plants cannot engage in photosynthesis without water. Animals can't move their muscles without water. Water provides the oxygen and the hydrogen that's needed for almost every organic reaction, to the point that without water, life as we know it simply would not function. Full stop. With that said, acquiring water is just as fundamental to animals as acquiring food or air, which I'll talk about in the following episodes. Just as food gives nutrients that get incorporated into the physical body of the animal, water works as a sustaining solution. It keeps everything hydrated, and it keeps everything working. Now, this is kind of a brutally simple explanation, because in real life, it's not so simple as just consume water, be hydrated, done. I mean, as far as the animal is concerned, that's the process. You know, you find water, you drink it, you're hydrated, you feel better. But on a biochemical level, on a cellular level, managing the internal water in an animal body is a complex balancing act of osmotic pressures and electrolyte concentrations. How animal bodies manage this osmotic pressure and the concentrations of all of these different electrolytes will be the key focus of today's episode. But first, I need to go into some of the basics of the chemistry and the physics of water, so as to provide a context for how water is used in animals. So, I'm sure that you know that if you have a dry towel or a piece of paper, and you touch the corner of it to some water, it will absorb the water, and the water will move up whatever dry surface it is that's touching it. This is osmosis, as the water is moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Diffusion is a general term and it means the movement of a substance from areas of high concentration to low concentration, as the individual particles in the solution bounce around. Their net movement is to go from high to low concentration. Things tend to spread out in the solution and become homogeneous. Now, animal cells have membranes, but they don't have cell walls. So water can freely flow between the phospholipids and through the protein pores in the cell's bilayer membrane. However, the particles in the solution, like nutrients and hormones and uh, other electrolytes and whatnot, these may not be able to pass through a membrane as easily as water. The membrane is a selectively permeable barrier, a, a layer, and it can create separate volumes of solution, like inside and outside of a cell. And the inside and the outside of the cell, separated by this plasma membrane, each contain different concentrations of chemicals or solutes. If the concentration of a solute outside of a cell is high, and inside the cell it's very low, the rule of diffusion will see a net movement of the solute across the membrane into the cell. This net movement across the membrane establishes a concentration gradient. This gradient is stronger, with larger differences between higher and lower concentrations. It's kind of like pressure. If you open your front door, the pressure change is negligible, because the pressure inside and outside of your house is usually pretty similar. However, if you were in an airplane and you opened the door, the change in air pressure would suck you out. If you were in the uh, International Space Station, if you somehow were to bypass the fail-safes and open some of those doors, the pressure difference between the inside of the space station and the near vacuum of outer space, it's massive. And so the moment you open that door just to crack, it'll result in explosive decompression. The force of the air that's explosively moving through the cracked space station door, it's kind of analogous to the chemical energy of a concentration gradient. 
A stronger concentration gradient is like a stronger flow of air, or like the flow of water in a river. To not get carried away in metaphors, the key detail here is that these physical phenomena provide a, a directional flow of energy, and this can be tapped, and that energy can be extracted and used for other things. This is hugely important in biology, where various types of concentration gradients, like proton gradients, are sustained so that they can yield energy to fuel other enzymatic reactions. The water provides the solution for these concentration gradients to exist. Now here's where it gets a little hairy. The concentration of water is associated with the concentration of solutes. So if you have an enclosed volume of water, and you add solutes to it, the concentration of the solutes will increase, but the concentration of the water decreases. The concentration of solutes in a solution is called the osmolarity. So if there's a lot of solutes, it's high osmolarity. If there's very few solutes, it's a, it's, it has a low osmolarity. Now, if there's a cell, and the cell has a membrane, and inside of the cell there are large solutes that cannot pass through the membrane, then there's a higher osmolarity inside of that cell than the outside, because it has a higher solute concentration on the inside, and the solutes can't get out. More solutes, therefore, equals higher osmolarity, but it also means a lower water concentration. And so as per the rules of diffusion, water will flow from high to low concentration. So in this scenario, water will flow into the cell, and the cell will expand. I talked about this a lot in more detail in episode 50 on plant hydration. The basic premise is that the water will try to flow so that it can equalize the concentration inside and outside the membrane, and it has to compensate for all of these large solutes that are stuck inside the membrane. Just as in plants, animals have to keep a healthy osmotic balance a healthy osmolarity, and this keeps their cells healthy and functioning properly. However, sometimes this osmolarity can be thrown out of whack, and this will cause osmotic stress, or water stress. Some organisms, like jellyfish, sponges, and flatworms, are osmoconformers, which means that their bodies have about the same osmolarity inside as the ocean water does outside of their bodies, and so they don't really have to worry too much about osmotic stress. They're never really too far out of range, and because of their physiology, it's difficult for them to get too far out of range of their environment, the ambient water. However, more complex animals aren't so lucky, and so they've had to evolve means of osmoregulation to manage this internal flow of water inside their tissues. These more complex organisms, like triploblasts, have tissues that are not at the same solute concentration as the ocean water, and so they have to engage in perpetual osmoregulation to keep their cells' water and electrolyte concentrations in balance. In ocean-dwelling fish, their tissues have fewer solutes than the surrounding ocean water, and this implies that two things will happen. Because the solute concentration is high in the ocean and low in their tissues, solutes will want to follow that concentration gradient and come into their tissues. But water will want to do the opposite. Water is in a higher concentration inside the tissues with the lower solute concentration. And so the ocean has a lower water concentration. And so water will try and flow out of the fish's tissues into the ocean water. And this can be dangerous because if these kind of come to an extreme, if uh, too many solutes diffuse into their tissues and or if their cells expel so much water that they'll shrink and wrinkle, they'll die. The fish has to drink a lot of seawater to replace the water lost through osmosis. But this ocean water that it drinks also has a lot of solutes in it. And so in response to all of this solute buildup in their tissues, the saltwater fish will actively transport electrolytes out of their cells to attempt to lower their osmolarity and thus lower the rate of water loss. Now what happens in ocean fish is the exact opposite for what happens in freshwater fish. Fresh water is relatively free of solutes, so the solute concentration of the tissue of a freshwater fish is generally higher than that of the water around it, like the fresh water of a lake or a river. The high osmolarity inside of the freshwater fish cells brings water in through osmosis, and their cells can swell up like an overfilled water balloon. If this problem isn't taken care of, their cells can burst, leading to injury and death. 
Furthermore, solutes will flow along their own concentration gradient, where they'll leach out of the fish's tissues and out into the water, because the water has a lower solute concentration than it does inside of the fish's cells. In response to this leak of solutes, the freshwater fish actively transport electrolytes into their cells, so as to stem the tide of outgoing solute diffusion. And because so much water comes into their cells as it is, they don't have to actively drink any water at all, but they still end up urinating quite a lot. So how do the fish pump solutes into or out of their cells? This is a really important topic that extends way beyond fish, to pretty much every other animal, every plant, every fungi, every protist and microbe that's alive today. Everything has cells with membranes, and these membranes are all studded with proteins. Many of these proteins take the shape of tubes or tunnels, and they penetrate the membrane and create a pore, or a channel for a particular solute to flow through. There's other proteins, like transport proteins, that have binding sites for various solutes. And upon binding with that solute, with that ion or electrolyte or whatever, they change conformation, and they carry the solutes across the membrane. The simplest example of this is passive transport. The channel allows a solute to flow across the membrane according to its concentration gradient, with no energy cost to the cell. Many channels are shaped in specific ways, such that only one type of solute can flow through them. For example, water flows through the membrane mainly through pores that are called aquaporins. And now this process is just, it's super simple, it's basic diffusion. But also understand that diffusion is the only way that water is moved. Water is virtually never actively transported. Now in cases where there are active transporters, or active carriers, the carrier protein moves the solute by changing conformation. The shape of the protein dictates how it moves the solute, and in this case, its shape change brings the solute across the membrane, from the inside to the outside, or from the inside to the outside. The conformational shape change also weakens the binding affinity of the protein to the solute, so that the solute is let go to float freely on whichever side of the membrane that it gets deposited. And when it's let go, the carrier protein reverts back to its original conformation. Now this is really neat, because in many of these cases, no energy is needed to power these conformational changes. They just happen automatically as the polar molecules in the protein react to the electronegativity or the polarity or something in the solute. I should specify that this actually isn't active transport. These are carrier proteins, which are separate from channel proteins, but if they just do this naturally through conformational changes that require no energy, this is also a form of passive transport, so I should correct myself. The active transport involves actual energy. It involves the cell spending chemical energy, like ATP. And spending this chemical energy powers the enzymes and the various reactions that actively move the solutes against their concentration gradient. The proteins that are involved in active transport are typically called pumps, because they work to pump solutes from areas of low to high concentration, which is the opposite direction of their concentration gradient. In primary active transport, for example, ATP is used to power the sodium-potassium pumps that move sodium and potassium across the cellular membranes. This is really important for cell membrane potential and pH, especially in neural cells. In secondary active transport, the pump can tap into the energy of a pre-existing chemical gradient to power itself and push solutes against their concentration gradient. If an organism is suffering from osmotic stress, it doesn't actively transport the water itself, so instead it will utilize these pumps and these transporter proteins to move solutes. Remember that water will flow from high to low concentration, and in a volume with solutes, this means that water will flow in the direction of high osmolarity towards the higher solute concentration so as to dilute it. So if the cells have a higher osmolarity than the surrounding water, water will flow into the cells and cause them to swell. So to counter this, the animals have to pump solutes out of their cells, so this osmotic gradient isn't as strong. And conversely, if cells have a lower osmolarity than the surrounding water, 
then water will flow out of the cells, and this will cause them to shrink. To counter this, the animal must pump solutes back into their cells, so that the osmotic gradient gets smaller and reduces the rate of water outflow, or helps to keep water retained within the cells. This may sound rather exhaustive, and it is. This is a perpetual chemical balancing act, but it's necessary to keep the organism alive. Now, I talked about osmotic regulation in saltwater and freshwater fish, but what about land animals? Land animals exist in an extremely dry environment relative to marine animals. The rocky dirt and open air is obviously a lot drier than a literal body of water, and as a result, water rapidly evaporates out of the tissues of land animals. Evaporation is most extensive in thin, moist tissues with high surface area, like the alveoli of the lungs. Land animals will also urinate, and this costs them water. Some land animals will sweat or pant to cool themselves down. This also costs a lot of water. Because of all these various water costs of living on dry land, dehydration is a serious risk for land animals, and so they all have to regularly consume water through drinking. This management of this internal water balance involves many factors besides solute concentrations. It also involves flushing out nitrogenous waste compounds that are toxic if they're retained and accumulate within the body. Nitrogen is present in many biomolecules, like the amino acids and protein and the nucleic acids in RNA and DNA. And in the course of regular, normal, healthy cellular activity, many of these nitrogen-containing substances are broken down. And some nitrogen ends up bound to hydrogen atoms to make NH3, or ammonia. Ammonia is relatively basic, and if it builds up in your cells, it can screw up the pH of the cellular environment. And this can be dangerous, if not outright deadly. In many animals, like mammals, this ammonia is converted into urea, which is then excreted as urine. In other animals, like reptiles, bugs, and birds, the ammonia is converted to uric acid. Now, uric acid is a thick, white goop, or a paste, which the birds and reptiles and the bugs then poop out. To examine how this works in vertebrates, let's take a deeper look at the kidney. The kidney is the organ responsible for water and electrolyte balance in vertebrate animals, and because the kidney is so important, they tend to come in pairs, for redundancy. In a nutshell, blood that's rich in nitrogenous waste is brought into the kidney through the renal artery, and the kidney cleans the blood and filters out the nitrogenous wastes and deposits them into a stream of water that flows through the ureter into the bladder. The renal vein then carries the cleaned blood away, back into the organism's body, where it can carry nutrients and oxygen and all the other good stuff that blood does. So in order to do all of this, the kidneys have to manipulate and move the water around on a chemical level. But this happens, again, entirely through the movement of solutes, not through the active transport of water itself. The kidney moves solutes by exploiting very strong concentration gradients. And in order to do this, it sets up a very kind of crazy cellular tube structure called a nephron. Each kidney is composed of about a million nephrons, and these all feed water thick with nitrogenous waste to the bladder. The nephron has four main regions, which I'll briefly cover. These are the renal corpuscle, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal tubule, which then feeds into the collecting duct. Okay, so let's go through the kidney like we were a piece of nitrogenous waste flowing through the blood. The renal artery splits up into smaller and smaller capillaries, and these end in terminal knots, or globular masses of veins that are called glomeruli, or uh, the singular term is glomerulus. The glomerulus is wrapped in the renal corpuscle, which is covered in slits and pores to facilitate the filtration of water and small solutes. The pressure that pushes the solutes out of the artery comes from the heart. As the heart beats and pushes blood, this pushes against these thin blood vessels, and water and stuff is kind of squeezed out and filtered into the renal corpuscle. 
this glomerulus filter works passively. There's no energy input. And so because of this just passive perpetual filtering, they can end up filtering a massive amount of fluid every day. About 180 liters of blood, or more than 40 gallons, get filtered through each of your kidneys every day. Anyways, this fluid that gets filtered into the renal corpuscle from the bloodstream contains water and nitrogenous wastes, among other various types of small solutes, and it all flows into the proximal tubule. The inner epithelial lining of this tubule is forested with little microvilli, tiny projections coming out of the cell that vastly increase the tubule's internal surface area. These microvilli are packed with active transport proteins and mitochondria. The active transport proteins work really hard to extract all of the valuable solutes that aren't waste, like vitamins and ionic nutrients and stuff like that, and they pull them out of the filtrate and return them to the body. While this process is very useful, it also uses a lot of energy. It uses a lot of ATP, and this is why these cells also have a very high density of mitochondria. After the proximal tubule, the filtrate flows into the very important loop of Henle. So the renal corpuscle is like a spherical pocket, and the proximal tubule is a short, tangled tube that hangs off of it. The loop of Henle is the part of the tube that suddenly descends straight down some variable distance towards the core of the kidney's medulla, before making a looping turn and coming straight back up. As fluid flows down the descending part of the loop, water will leak out in high quantities, back into the surrounding matrix of cells. The water concentration inside the loop of Henle rapidly drops, and the filtrate in the loop becomes very heavy, very thick with solutes. This water outflow is caused by the osmotic gradient set up farther along the loop, in the part that's coming back up. In this ascending part of the loop, Water doesn't leak out, but ions like sodium and chlorine do. Farther up the loop, these ions are actively pumped out, which lowers the osmolarity of the filtrate. All of these ions getting pumped out of the ascending part of the loop increases the solute concentration in the nearby cells, which is what then pulls water out of the descending part of the loop. So it's kind of like a self-reinforcing cycle that maintains an osmotic gradient within the kidney. And all of the vitamins and nutrients and ions that have been extracted from the nephron so far, they're all absorbed by a mesh of blood vessels that wrap around the nephron, which carries the nutrients back into the bloodstream. At this point, the filtrate still in the nephron is at the end of the loop of Henle, and it's entering the distal tubule. The filtrate has a low concentration of useful solutes like vitamins and nutrients, and it has a high concentration of both water and waste solutes, like urea. This fluid flows from the loop of Henle into the distal tubule, which then feeds it into the collecting duct. And the collecting duct is pretty much where multiple nephrons all dump their waste fluid. And all this merges together, and it flows into the ureters, which are corridors leading to the bladder. The ureter leads to the bladder, the bladder stores the urine, and then when the animal releases the urine, it travels out the urethra. In animals that are dehydrated, if they're suffering from water stress, you know, they haven't drank any water in a while, this can create urine that has a very low water concentration because the animal's body is trying to retain as much water as possible. And so its urine will also have a very high urea concentration. This will make their urine appear a dark yellow and have a very strong odor. Now, conversely, a well-hydrated animal can afford to lose uh, a little bit more water in its urine. So these hormones that control uh, water regulation, they're not as active, and so the urine is more diluted with water, and this makes the urine a paler yellow or a clear color with a relatively weak odor. The kidney is a remarkably refined organ, which makes it very effective and very powerful. This is good because the demands that are put on the kidney are very high. Filtering the waste out of 40 gallons of blood every day is no small task, and it takes a very tightly and very carefully regulated dance between all of the different concentration gradients to make it all work. 
But of course, this is how it works only in vertebrate animals. Invertebrate animals, like arthropods, have just as much need for osmoregulation, but they have a radically different physiology set up to do it. Insects, for example, breathe through a very thin layer of epithelial tissue that permeates their bodies, like a network. At certain points, this epithelial layer is exposed to the dry air. It comes out of the exoskeleton in little pores or points. And here, gas exchange occurs through diffusion. Carbon dioxide diffuses out and oxygen diffuses in, and water vapor can potentially be lost. Now this can get dangerous very quickly, because arthropods tend to be small, so any evaporation can rapidly alter their internal osmosis. In some species, this epithelial layer lines the inside of a network of tubes called a tracheal network, or a tracheal system, and these are exposed to the external environment at little points or pores that are called spiracles. These spiracles can be opened and closed so as to allow the insect to regulate its water evaporation. Instead of blood, insects have a fluid called hemolymph, but this has basically the exact same purpose as blood. The hemolymph is pumped around the body with a heart, and it carries nutrients and oxygen and all of the good stuff that keeps the arthropod alive. To get rid of wastes that build up in the hemolymph, these land-based invertebrates use structures called malphigian tubes. These tubules are in contact with the hemolymph, and they have potassium pumps that are used to extract potassium from the hemolymph, which then accumulates within these malphigian tubules. This increases their internal solute concentration, and it increases their osmolarity, and this in turn brings water in through osmosis. The water flow allows nitrogenous waste to come into the tubules, where it then forms a pre-urine filtrate. This pre-urine filtrate then flows into the hindgut, which is kind of like a repository for waste, except the insect can tap the hindgut and extract water if the insect happens to be too dehydrated. Useful things, like nutritious electrolytes and non-waste compounds, are selectively reabsorbed from the hindgut, while the waste products will remain and they'll accumulate. In most insects, up to 95% of the water in the malphigian tubules is reabsorbed. And since the urea is left behind in the hindgut, it gets excreted as a dense, relatively dry mass of solutes. Alright, so I've talked about these mechanisms in relative detail for land-dwelling creatures, so let me return to the oceans, to the lakes and rivers and ponds and stuff, to briefly retouch on how fish manage their osmoregulation on a cellular and physiological level. Remember that for jellyfish and corals and stuff like this, these animals don't really need to bother with osmoregulation at all, because the water and solute concentrations inside of their bodies is pretty much identical to the concentration outside their bodies. And for this reason, these organisms are called osmoconformers. And just as I explained before, freshwater and saltwater fish are osmoregulators, because they have to constantly work to regulate and maintain a proper osmotic balance in a marine environment that doesn't match that within their body. Recall from earlier in the episode that freshwater tends to have a low solute concentration lower than the solute concentration inside the cells of the freshwater fish. This means that water will flow into the fish cells and cause them to expand. And it also means that solutes will flow out of the fish, going from high concentration in the fish cells to the low concentration in the freshwater. To stop this solute outflow, the fish has to actively transport solutes back into its cells, but this also plays a role in increasing the amount of water that comes into their cells. And if you have a higher osmolarity in your cells, water wants to come in. So to maintain this balance, these freshwater fish, they don't drink any water at all, because they get all the water they need from this diffusion dynamic. Now this is all well and good if you're just a freshwater fish who spends all of their time in fresh water. However, not all freshwater fish live in freshwater their whole lives. Some fish, like salmon, have a life cycle that involves transitioning between freshwater and saltwater, 
which necessarily means that they need the cellular capacity to actively transport solutes both into their tissues and out of their tissues, depending on the osmolarity of the water in which they're currently living. Recent research has shown that these fish may actually possess two groups of epithelial cells in their gills, dedicated to each kind of solute transport. One group of cells, or one layer of this tissue, is active in fresh water, pumping solutes into the body. And the other group of cells, the other bit of tissue, is active in salt water, pumping solutes out of the body. Additionally, there are even different types of sodium and potassium pumps, and these are expressed at different times in the fish's life, and in response to the external environment. Even more, there are enzyme pumps that have been shown to move from one side of the cell to the other, so as to facilitate solute pumping in either direction at a moment's notice. These are all evolved strategies for handling a dynamic solute load from the external environment. In a more general sense, these are just some of the many ways in which animals manage their water reserves to keep themselves hydrated, to keep themselves healthy and alive. I found it really interesting studying animal hydration, especially in some of my college classes, because the way my professors described it would really help me visualize life as this constantly flowing chemical architecture. And organisms are this dynamic, breathing entity with a body full of complex swelling and flowing, with raising and lowering concentration gradients, and expanding and shrinking cells, all morphing and bubbling along together in this beautifully regulated water dance. It's just incredible. And with that, I think that uh, this is the end of the episode, folks. Uh, there's your rundown on animal hydration. I hope you found this episode educational and thought-provoking, and at the very least, I hope you found it entertaining. If you're getting a kick out of this, if you're really enjoying this kind of animal physiology stuff, then be sure to come by and check out next week's episode, where I'll be exploring the chemical dynamics and the internal physiology of animal nutrition. I'll talk about how animals acquire their food, how they consume their food and digest nutrients, and how all of this affects their bodies, how it affects their behavior and their evolution. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.